This is Duke University. Hi, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to the Griffith Film Theater. My apologies for squinting, I'm usually on, on, on the back end there. Um, my name is Hardy Vuer, I'm a member of the class of 93, and currently serving as the president of the Duke Alumni Association. I had um, a freshman class here, political science in the back row, and I was um, notoriously late and always asleep. That won't happen today, at least the asleep part, not with Dr. <laughs> Hare. Um, so what is human about our mind and brain, and how did it get that way? Well, Dr. Brian Hare is one of Duke's leading experts in answering these questions. Dr. Hare is an associate professor of evolutionary anthropology and a member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, which is a division of the Duke Institute for Brain Science. Um, Dr. Hare also leads the Human Psychology Research Group, which compares the psychology of hom hominoids and seeks to identify which features of human social problem-solving abilities have evolved since humans, bonobos, and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor. In addition, the center compares the psychology of various primates, for example, lemurs, and non-primates, such as dogs, to identify cases of psychological convergence, which may provide a unique opportunity to infer how human-like social skills have evolved. In his spare time, Dr. Hare founded the new, the, the new Duke Can Canine Cognition Center, which is dedicated to the study of dog psychology and understanding the flexibility and limitations of dog cognition. There, people bring in their pet dogs to the center um, and work through some problem-solving games to better understand the effect of domestication on dog cognition, identify breed differences in problem-solving abilities, and generally understand the limits of dog cognition. And another goal of the center is to better understand how we might help dogs be more effective companion animals, for example, in helping the, the disabled and the detection of substances. Featured in documentaries and widely published, you may have seen him in Nova, Dr. Hare's new book, The Genius of Dogs, was written with his wife, Vanessa Woods, and is due out next year. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Hare to the stage. Nice introduction. So you guys can hear me in the back. That's very important to me. You can hear me? Fantastic. OK. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, obviously, um, to talk to Duke alum and tell you a little bit about the research going on um, here at Duke. Um, and what I want to do today is sort of take you on a, uh, a tour of lots of different questions that we ask. and. Um, uh, tell you all about not only our comparisons of uh, humans to chimpanzees and bonobos, our two closest relatives, but I also want to tell you a little bit about um, how we try to use the knowledge that we gain um, to serve uh, society as well. Uh, and then we're going to turn and look at um, lemurs a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about the work with lemurs, and then we're going to uh, uh, highlight some of the work uh, that we're doing with dogs as well. Um, and I'll try to illustrate this work with videos and uh, not much data, uh, so that it'll be really fun. Uh, and not only do I want to not only do I want to illustrate with videos instead of data, um, but I also am going to need your help. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is how wonderful human cooperation is and how powerful we are as cooperators. So I'm hoping that people are going to be interested in volunteering to participate in a couple of experiments. So already start thinking if you feel up to that. It's a small crowd still. So you won't be embarrassed in front of that many people. <laughs> OK. So that's number one. And then number two is, before I forget, I just want to emphasize that um, one, of the, one of the really fun things about what I do is, first of all, I started doing this type of research when I was 19 years old at Emory University. In fact, I came to the Duke Lemur Center um, and was handed one of my greatest scientific defeats when I was first tried to study lemur cognition. Um, and thankfully, I work with lots of Duke undergraduates who are incredibly talented and far more creative than I was and have come up with fantastic ways to study these animals. But what I want to emphasize to you is that a lot of the research you're going to see today is driven by undergraduates at Duke. We are, our, one of our major emphasis is to make this research accessible to freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and we have many, many undergraduates that participate. And a lot of the, especially the lemur and the dog work, is impossible without undergraduate. Um, help. Okay, so what I want to do immediately is um, 
recruit some volunteers because we're going to play a couple of games. But before we do that, um, let me just get some water here. Um, who thinks they might want to play a cognitive game? Okay, great. We have some brave people. All right, y'all come down here. Awesome. Okay. So do we have anybody else who is just itching to play a cognitive game? Because I want to make sure everybody, if there are other people who would like to do this. And I would say that I've already got sex skew in my sample, so we've got problems here of how representative this will be. Okay. The, the lady in the back, I think we, you two can, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have these two play the first game, and then we'll have these young ladies come play the second game. How's that sound? Okay. So, uh, it's very simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a board that has some instructions on it, and one of you is going to read the instructions to the other, uh, and uh, the other person just has to solve the problem. Okay? And um, it's really that simple. Uh, so you just have to decide which, which role you would like. Who feels strong as, a, as like they're a strong reader? Uh, okay, all right. So Ed's going to read and Paul's going to try to solve the problem. Okay. All right, so here's what we're going to do. <coughs> so Ed, all you want to do is just read this panel to Paul. And I'll even give you this microphone. We can turn this on so that everybody can hear you really, really well. They want, you want to use my All right. Hello, hello. Oh, it's already on. There we go. Okay. okay. It starts off by asking the question, are you smarter than an ape? <laughs> no, it's going to be fun. Don't worry. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Retrieve the ball. How well can you use tools? Before you, Here's is a ball. simple task. Get the ball out of the cylinder without removing the container from the platform. You are free to use any and all the tools in front of you to achieve your goal. A chimp had longer to solve this puzzle, but you have all the tools right here. Can you do it in under 15 seconds? Let's find out. Ready, set, go. One 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000. Five one thousand, six one thousand, seven one thousand, eight one thousand, nine one thousand, ten one thousand, eleven one thousand, twelve one thousand, thirteen one thousand, fourteen one thousand, fifteen one thousand. Okay, but wait, come around here and show what you're doing. Come around here so people can see. wire and take some tape and attach it to a wire that reverse the tape and so it's sticky oh, I'm not supposed to touch it and uh, that's not working out very well <coughs> all right so thank you thank you guys thank you Ed and Paul let's give them a hand uh, round of applause don't go anywhere because I want to show you um, what your closest relative who lives on a uh, orphanage in Ngamba Island in Uganda uh, what their solution was to this problem the first time they saw it um, and this is young Yo-Yo, is an eight-year-old chimpanzee. And what I forgot to show you is, hopefully you can all see this from the back, is there's a plexiglass tube just like this one. It's attached to the bars here. And at the bottom is what's the equivalent of like a Duke diploma for a chimpanzee. It's three peanuts. OK. And so she has no tools, uh, so to speak. Uh, but she's going to solve this in 15 seconds and immediately use the answer. Okay, so Paul, you get one more chance at redemption. And I hate to do this. I hate to do this to you publicly, but there, there is a very male solution to this problem. There's actually two solutions. Uh, and so when we tested the male chimpanzees, they, they actually solved this another way. Yeah. It's a male solution, very male. Good job, yo yo! Good job! So they actually peed in the tube um, and filled it up and then got the peanuts. 
<laughs> no, 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 no demonstration necessary, but I just thought, all right, so thank you guys. I appreciate it. That was awesome. Thank you. Give me a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, where are my, where are my next set of volunteers? Please, come down here. Oh, no, no, oh. You can, you can, <laughs> you can, you can read the board. This game is better anyway. You're playing for Starburst. Okay. Paul, you are a good sport. Thank you. How are you doing, Meredith? Okay, let's see. This is the front and that is the back. Excellent. All right, so we're going to do the same thing. Tell me your name. <coughs> Mal. Mal. Nice, nice to meet you. Okay, so who wants to read and who wants to play? Okay, Mal wants to read. Very good, very good. So here is the board. <laughs> no, no, it's the same, same structure, same structure. Okay. There's your mark. Uh, are you smarter than an ape? Get the candy reaching test. Uh, now I'm addressing you. The, <laughs> the only thing between you and that candy is some glass. It's all yours. But remember, sometimes when we want something really badly, we just go straight for it. Could an ape ever think of a better way to get something than a human could? Okay, so here's the trick, Meredith, which is I want you to imagine that you're in a situation where I've just placed a starbur starburst on this side, but imagine there's a brick wall all here, okay? And so all you've got to do is get the starburst. Okay, so I have the bottom and the base brick. Well, the idea is that this is all blocked. Everything's blocked. That's right. Okay, so, and you have, let's say, 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7. Oh, Meredith, a duke. Star, very good. All right, fantastic. <laughs> Woo! So I think we've, we've definitely shown a sex difference in cognition here today from Duke alum. Very good, good job. High five. All right, that's it. So do you guys want some more Starburst? <laughs> Meredith, Mal, would you like Starburst? No, no. Are you the whole bag? Yes, take it. Fantastic. You guys were very good sports. Okay, so it ends up that before the age of five years old, young children have a desperately difficult time with that type of problem. Um, and so we went to um, Kinshasa this is the the left. Of left. Okay, the left. and played this game Let's with some bonobos. Do the and this is the very first trial we gave a bonobo to see if they could solve this exact same problem. Wow. Oh. wow. <laughs> okay. So. Research can be fun. That's the first thing that I'd like to communicate to you. We have a lot of fun because uh, sometimes when I, do, when, when I worked in, uh, I worked at a zoo in Germany where uh, the experiments we do are available to um, uh, the public. So you can actually watch uh, the experiments being done as a visitor to the zoo in Leipzig, Germany. And often visitors were you know, saying, you know, they're just feeding the animals. They're just feeding the animals. But of course, we're actually looking at how they solve problems and what I'm really, really interested in when I study cognition and when I study animal cognition, and this is a very important theme for today, is that I'm not interested in can they learn something slowly through stimulus and response, think Skinner uh, back in the day. What I'm really interested in, can animals make inferences? Do they understand how uh, the world works, whether it's the physical world, or whether do they understand how the minds of other individuals work, and can they um, navigate their social world and the world in general by making inferences and, and using understanding to solve novel problems that they've never seen before. And those two uh, games we just played are examples where um, we found that uh, chimpanzees and bonobos can solve problems spontaneously without any training, and we think that this really represents some flexibility that you only find in other apes. Um, and other apes includes orangutans, gorillas, and of course humans, because what we've learned through um, comparisons of the genetics of uh, ourselves to other non-human apes is that actually humans are in the ape family. And the reason that we know that is because the surprise was before 1984, if you asked evolutionary anthropologists or paleoanthropologists, you'd say, okay, well, where do humans fit into the taxonomy of the animal world? They'd say, oh, we have this really separate family and the great apes that we were talking about 
They're our close relative, but very distantly related. But what happens is in 1984, people have new genetic techniques. And specifically, we're, allowed, we're able to do DNA hybridization. We can compare our genome to the genome of all these great apes. And son of a gun, what happens one morning is chimpanzees and bonobos wake up to find out that they're actually more closely related to us genetically than they are to gorillas. So what a shocker for them. So <laughs> the, the, um, and the important thing to understand is that and the shock, of course, is that gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos are all furry, black, large, monkey-looking things. But it ends up that chimpanzees and bonobos share almost all of our DNA, whereas gorillas do not. And so that's where people realize, oh my gosh, humans are actually in the ape family. OK. So that's why it's really fun to study these species, because I can use them to answer this first question, which is, what is it that makes us human? But I'm also interested in, so we have our three species represented here. But I can also an, try to answer an even more difficult question, which is, um, how did we get that way? And I do that by studying dogs at the Duke Canine Cognition Center, which I'm really happy that we have this on campus. We're actually the only university that has an on-campus canine cognition center, so we're first. Um, and so uh, I, we can study dogs to answer questions about how did we get that way. And of course, we're so lucky to have the Duke Lemur Center uh, to answer to work on this question as well. All right, so um, another quiz for everybody. Uh, is this a bonobo? Raise your hand. OK. Is this a bonobo? Raise your hand. All right, so this is the chimpanzee on this side, and this is the bonobo on this side. OK. And here's what's confusing, is everybody's heard of a chimpanzee. Almost nobody's heard of a bonobo. And we're going to talk more about bonobos and why they're exciting and interesting. Uh, because when I first learned about bonobos, they blew my mind. I couldn't believe that I had never heard of them. Um, and it makes knowing about chimpanzees even more exciting and thinking about human evolution as well. Um, but here's what's confusing, is we have two closest relatives represented on this picture. But when you tell people that, it's like, well, how can you have two closest relatives? You don't have a tie in March Madness in the NCAA tournament. There's only one number one, baby. So the, you know, how do you have two closest relatives? But it's not that hard to understand, because it's just like if you have two aunts or two uncles or you have two siblings. They're equally closely related to you genetically, but they're each individually different from each other. So that's what it is with bonobos and chimpanzees. We have two cousins that are our closest living relatives genetically. They're different from each other, just like two cousins would be, but they share equal amounts of DNA with us. OK, so I hope that helps. So where do these guys live? Um, you'd be interested to know that um, chimpanzees historically live all across equatorial Africa. This is West Africa. This is um, Central Africa. Well, I guess this is Central Africa. And then this is East Africa here. So chimpanzees actually live all across, or historically live all across Africa. Of course, now it's, um, there's a, a horrible problem of um, uh, the bushmeat trade and poaching, et cetera, and they're, they're in major decline and an endangered species, but historically, that's their range. Where do bonobos live? Um, well, about a million years ago, the Congo River shows up, and it divides the common ancestor of bonobos and chimpanzees into two areas uh, where they are now separated. And the only place you find bonobos in the wild is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the irony of this will become very clear as we continue. Um, so you have two species that live what's called allopatrically. They're not sympatric. They don't live in the same place. They live in two different places, and that's what allowed them to evolve and be very different from one another. OK. So the reason that it's so exciting to have these two relatives to think about is because there are a lot of things that I could ask you, and actually we have uh, educational programs where we go out into the schools and ask school children this all the time. What is it that you think is unique about humans? And they have so many amazing ideas, and you can fill a chalkboard full of all their ideas. But what's so cool is that when you're studying bonobos and chimpanzees, you can ask questions about your ideas about what you think it is to be human, but you can look at a close relative that's genetically almost identical to you, but has no social norms to speak of, has you know, a culture, but is very, very depauperate relative to humans, and of course, is without language. So you can ask, what is the biological basis of things like sociality and economic preferences 
in complex societies, because these animals live in, in large groups and have complicated social lives, any soap opera you've ever adored is boring compared to what you could see at the zoo if you knew the individual animals in the enclosure. Um, and so what you can learn is what is going on cognitively or psychologically in an animal that's almost genetically identical to us but has no culture, has no language. All right, so we ask all sorts of crazy questions of these animals, such as, uh, do they, how do they form trusting relationships? Do they negotiate? Uh, do they have risk preferences? Do they have sex differences? Um, uh, do they, why do they coerce each other when they do? Are they, is their dominance hierarchy egalitarian or is it despotic? And why is it egalitarian or despotic? Do they share? Why do they share? When do they share? Are they capable of deception? Why do they deceive? Who do they deceive? Are there differences between the two species? Do they punish each other? Um, why do they punish each other? Does one species punish and the other doesn't? Um, and we can look at things like xenophobia, and of course, we can also look at things like um, lethal aggression. Why is it that some species may kill, kill individuals of the same species and others don't? So what I want to talk to you about first is lethal aggression in chimpanzees, uh, and then second, I'm going to talk to you about risk preferences in uh, bonobos uh, and chimpanzees in comparison between the two species. Okay, this is a horrible slide. This is probably the worst slide of the whole talk. Um, because this is uh, humans at their worst. Uh, this is a slide from National Geographic uh, totting up genocide um, uh, at the hands of um, humanity, basically humans killing each other and, and doing it quite well um, between 1900 and 2005. And of course, the Americas are left out, but if you went back another 100 years, the United States would be, uh, have a quite big circle there um, in, in for uh, what happened to the Native Americans, of course. So the point of this slide is um, I'm just like Indiana Jones. I, I think that you know, uh, you know, he always ha has Nazis as the bad guys, and they're really a great bad guy to have um, because it's such pure evil. It was all um, so clearly planned ahead, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the danger of associating genocide with Nazism is that you think that it was, the, it was just about Germany, and you think it was just about the Nazis, but it's not. It ends up that genocide is something that humans do. And history uh, demonstrates that quite clearly. And so one of the questions is, why is it that humans have this problem uh, where we are so good at killing each other? All right, well, it ends up that chimpanzees and bonobos have a lot to say about this question. So the first reason, and I'm sorry for the gruesome slide at the bottom, but that's the reality, which is that chimpanzees have a darker side just like humans. They're incredibly good at killing each other. Um, and now, uh, with decades of research in Africa and multiple field sites all across um, uh, equatorial Africa, we know that it's a fact that chimpanzees are quite efficient at killing one another. Um, they're very territorial, they're very xenophobic, so they are scared of strangers and unfamiliar individuals, and they're very aggressive towards them. They kill infants of their neighbors, and they will actually, uh, there are cases where as many as 40 adult males will go into a neighboring territory hunt down the males of the other group and viciously kill them in what is absolutely a gruesome event to observe, which people have um, documented. I could tell you the details privately because it's pretty bad. Okay, and then you have bonobos. Uh, and this is more like what uh, uh, territorial interaction looks like when you observe bonobos in the wild. They essentially have sex with each other. Um, no bonobo has ever been observed killing another bonobo, ever. No infanticide, uh, no lethal aggression towards adults, uh, and in fact, no no male is able to female uh, to coerce female. So tomorrow, is there a shot the Could be. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's how bad it is with chimpanzees. Uh, this is a comparison, and this is one of the only data slides I'm going to show you. But the reason this is important is that when a comparison was done between um, different cultures of humans, this is the rate at which chimpanzees kill one another, um, two different measures of the rate at which they kill one another in comparison to um, farmers, pastoralists who live in developing countries, and then people who are still living without agriculture. They're called foraging populations, they're hunter-gatherers. And when you look at the rate of um, lethal aggression in humans and you compare it to chimpanzees, the data that we now have available from about 60 years of research, it's very similar. Um, and so 
what this suggests the possibility is that lethal aggression in humans is not simply driven by culture necessarily. There might also be a biological basis to what we're doing to each other. And actually, it's shared with chimpanzees. Uh, and this is a, an amazing paper, and also equally disturbing, which is that now we have fantastic data from uh, a population of chimpanzees that live in Uganda. This is the Ngogo group of chimpanzees, and this is a map representing their old territory in dark gray and their new territory that they have now annexed by killing 30 chimpanzees in the neighboring group over an eight-year period. They systematically hunted down their neighbors, killed them, took their territory, and all the females in their group. Okay, so the question then is, is there a biological basis for this? And the only way we can figure out what's going on is, of course, by looking at our close relatives. All right, but the fun and amazing thing is that we also have another close relative, thank God. Um, and bonobos are actually the only peaceful ape. So how do they do it? Well, what they do is they actually turn on its head the normal situation in nature. Regardless of what species you look at, almost inevitably, a larger animal is going to be dominant to a smaller animal. Anybody who's had pets or dogs or anything else, um, maybe small kids, uh, you have a kid who's slightly older than the younger kid, the older kid is going to pick on the younger kid because basically they're bigger. They can. Okay, that's the normal rule, right? Well, guess what? It don't work in bonobos. Um, little Mimi here, who weighs 33 kilos, is actually dominant to Tatango, who weighs 46 kilos. Okay, so how do they do it? That's one of my questions I really need to answer. Well, they do it with girl power. And what do I mean by that? Well, it ends up that bonobos have found the solution to the problem that chimpanzees and humans have not solved, which is that females do not tolerate male aggression, period. So if males, if a male bonobo like Tatanga, who Tatanga really, really wanted to be a male chimpanzee, uh, if a male bonobo tries to be a male chimpanzee and coerce females and actually force them into mating with them, uh, beating them in order to intimidate them so that they'll mate with them, et cetera, um, the first thing actually that um, a male chimpanzee does when it starts to go through puberty is it starts to beat its mother. It beats up its mother, dominates its mother, and then starts working on everybody else in the group. Okay, so chimps have a darker side. Bonobos, if any, any male chimpanzee, or sorry, bonobo tries to do any of that, all the female bonobos in the group gang up on that individual and beat him up. So, no individual male can overcome eight females chasing them through the forest. And therefore, bonobos do not have male aggression. So, um, uh, or I should say, do not have lethal aggression and do not have the same level of uh, uh, the same level of consequences of male aggression as you see in chimpanzees and humans. Okay, so how do the females stick together though? Because here's the remarkable thing: chimpanzees, females immigrate when they go through puberty into a new group. They're not related to anybody in the in the group, so they have no relative to support them in fights. So you've got males beating you up and no females who are related to you. Why would anybody want to support you anyway? Okay, bonobos, it's the exact same situation. Female bonobos leave their natal group and they transfer into a new group with all sorts of unrelated females who they don't know. But those females support the stranger if males try to coerce them into doing bad things. Okay, and I'm not saying that this is definitely, this is not necessarily a model for humanity, but this is the solution that bonobos have come to and how females have managed this is they actually bond by having sex with each other. So this is two females that we've given some food to. I don't know if it's possible to cut the lights a little bit. These are two female bonobos and you're gonna see that they are actually gonna um, share the food. <laughs> and then they rub genitals with each other and Female genitalia and bonobos are absolutely remarkable. Their clitorises have actually become much more um, pronounced and they're much more forward-facing. 
Um, and that allows two females to rub their clitorises together. And when you watch them, it's obviously it's very difficult to measure physiologically. You can't just interview them. Um, but they do uh, uh, vocalize in such a way, in, in a unique way, uh, during these interactions that would suggest that they enjoy this. Um, so uh, basically, you have females um, uh, having sexual interactions with each other. And through this sex, they form trusting bonds and friendships that then they use to um, keep males from intimidating and beating up all the other individuals in the group. Um, and the interesting thing is I told, you about, um, I told you about young male bonobos. And they don't beat up their mothers. And in fact, what do young male bonobos do if they don't beat up their mothers? Well, if you're a juvenile bonobo, and a bonobo male, and you would like to be successful at mating, the last thing you do is beat up your mother because your access into the social network is through your mother. And if you're a mama's boy, and you're a really good one, your mom will invite, will invite you and introduce you into polite company, and all of her lady friends can then be your potential future mates. So bonobos have completely turned the normal social um, math on its head. Uh, and so it's absolutely fascinating, because of course they've done this without any culture, without any language, and without any social norm. All right, so as, a, as somebody who's interested in the biological basis of behavior, our next question is, can we try to figure out what's going on with the psychology and the physiology responsible for this species that can do something that even our own species can't manage? Um, and so we've looked at things like um, how their hormones change when they're faced with a, a competition. Um, and so this is a study with um, chimpanzees and bonobos. And we looked at the response of cortisol, which is a stress hormone that sort of is a, that reacts when you find yourself in a stressful situation, and then testosterone, which sort of responds when you find yourself in a competitive context. And we just com we basically gave food to chimps and bonobos, like you just saw in that last video, and then we we got saliva. We got them to give us some saliva, and then we looked at the response of these hormones after they were in this competition. Okay, well actually before and after, and compared the before and after. And what we see is that chimpanzees much like human males, um, have uh, no change in their cortisol, but they have a big change in their testosterone. So basically, they get put in a context where it uh, involves a lot of competition, potentially. They have a huge rush in, in testosterone, and they're ready to try to outcompete their competitor. Okay? Bonobos, on the other hand, have a very bizarre response that had not been observed in primates before, which is that they have a huge uptick in cortisol and no response in testosterone. And so this is actually consistent with basically uh, a coping mechanism to social stress. And there's some rodents who have a response like this. And the rodents who have this response basically um, are very passive and use social interactions to build up trust. And they actually um, often um, will not have sex, but they um, uh, hug each other as, rodent, as much as a rodent can. Um, they sort of rub their bodies up against each other um, until they reduce the, the stress. OK. so. Um, first of all, what this establishes, there, there is probably a biological basis, some physiology that underlies the differences we're seeing. This is Tori Wober. I'm just about to go to her dissertation defense. I co-advise her. She's actually at Harvard. Um, and she found uh, by look, and, and she was the first author in the last paper. She's also the first author in this paper. And we also looked at the development of, the, of, these same, of testosterone, sorry, in bonobos and chimps. And what did we find was a big surprise, which I'm not sure I can even explain. Well, not surprising is chimpanzees look just like humans. As you are a male and you get older, your testosterone level goes up. Um, uh, once you pair bond and have a, have a child, and as you get older, your testosterone levels go down. Uh, but when you hit puberty, there's a spike, and your testosterone go up. Okay. So that's a pretty normal mammalian pattern that we see in our own species as well. But when we looked at bonobos, you get no pubertal spike in testosterone. What you have is incredibly high levels when they're young, and then you have just a complete flat line. So what, we're, what we think is going on with this really high level when they're young is that this is driving their libidinous behavior. Because my wife and I have actually done an observational study, and I know it sounds disturbing, but we had to. Is it was an observational study of infant bonobos having sex with each other and then looking at infant chimpanzees to see if they have sex with each other. And the answer is, watching infant chimpanzees is very boring. We never saw anything. Um, but the bonobos had tons of sex with each other. 
So two and three year old baby bonobos are rubbing genitals all the time whenever anything exciting is happening. And I think what happens is that they have very high levels of testosterone when they're young. They're basically um, forming trusting bonds by having um, uh, sexual interactions. Now remember, this is not intercourse. Um, this is just rubbing genitals. Um, and so then uh, um, they just go along happily, but then there's no pubertal spike, which is really strange. And that may be related to why male bonobos don't, don't, don't then have an uptick in their aggressive behavior um, uh, as they um, enter puberty. But we're working on this, but it's totally fascinating and a, and a fun challenge. Okay, so given that I've just told you that there's this, these interesting behavioral differences that have been observed in the, in the wild, and the fact that we have these this evidence of physiology that being different between these two species, as a psychologist, I gotta get in there and figure out what's going on. I gotta know, okay? Is it that bonobos really have the cognitive capability? Are they able to actually um, intentionally, on purpose, prefer to help another bonobo? Um, is it that when, they're, when a female bonobo is preventing a male from being mean, is she doing that somehow altruistically? Is she trying to help uh, another individual? Or is it something that's sort of hardwired and there's no um, capability for them to really even be aware of what's going on? So together with the first uh, Congolese student ever to study uh, bonobo psychology, Susie Quatwinda, uh, we conducted a, a very simple experiment that if I did this with chimpanzees would have been very short. Um, and the way that it worked is we put a food pile uh, these are three rooms next to each other in a row, and we put a food pile in the room in the middle. And all we did is let a bonobo into the room, okay? With a chimpanzee, the experiment's over. What would they do? Eat the food. That's right. Okay. So, but my student, and actually, because I'd studied chimpanzees for a long time before I started studying bonobos in 2005, I was like, Susie, is nothing's going to happen. They're just going to eat the food. She says, no, 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 I've seen them in the, because she lives there and works with them every day. And she says, I've seen them do things where they give food to each other, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure that something interesting is going to happen. So, all right, let's do an experiment. Uh, why not? All right, so what we did is we gave, we, not only did we let this guy in before breakfast, they're very hungry in the morning, to see if they just eat the food, which is what I thought would happen. Um, but there are two doors. And what I thought was going to happen is they would open the one-way key, and go into the room to get away from this other bonobo, because I don't want you to watch me as I eat all this delicious food, okay? But they can also, what Susie thought they would do, is they would open the door and actually let this bonobo in and eat together, okay? And intentionally share the food. All right, and that's what they do. Uh, they have a huge preference to open the door and let the other guy in. About half the time, uh, about half of the trials, we gave them uh, 10 trials, and about six of the 10 trials, they immediately run in, open the door, let this guy in, eat the food together, and they almost never open this door, okay? So if Susie wins, which of course I was just like, this is the coolest thing ever, oh my God, I can't believe this. Okay, but then what we noticed in the first experiment was that the recipient here, half of the time it was somebody that the, the subject was unfamiliar with. And half of the time, it was somebody the subject knew and was in their group. And actually, we got the strongest sharing towards the stranger, towards the individual the bonobo didn't know, which that was a surprise. Another surprise. So then we said, all right, let's see if this is real. What's going on? So I have the first Chinese graduate student who's ever studied great apes outside of China. Um, so he's working in Africa. And if anybody's been following China's uh, the growing footprint that China has in Africa, you know that it's incredibly important to support Chinese academics, um, uh, especially in areas such as this, given that we're working in Africa with these endangered species where China has um, growing economic interests. So Hippo had the great idea that why don't we, um, uh, his name's Kenji Tan, but his nickname is Hippo because we butcher his name so badly. Uh, he prefers to be called Hippo. So, um, Hippo had the great idea that we should just give them a test between group mates and strangers. So that's what we did. And we let the subject back in again. And here's our one-way keys. And they can choose to just eat all the food like a chimpanzee would. Or they can open the door for a group mate or a stranger. And what we found was they had a huge preference for opening the door for the stranger. Okay, But it gets more interesting than that. And this, even Hippo didn't predict, um, is they opened the door for the stranger. But guess what the stranger did? That's right. They didn't eat the food. They went and opened the door for the other guy, and then they all ate the food together. Okay. 
So pretty shocking stuff. So we always, these were two females. And half of these were male and half of these were female. And we don't get a sex difference in the sharing here. And we control age and sex of the potential recipient. And actually, they did 30% of the time have sex with each other, but it was never intercourse. It was always genital, genital rubbing. So it's not um, uh, reproductive. OK, so I'm going to uh, just show you what this looks like really quickly. This is Susie. And she's going to put the food. Oops. That's my daughter. That's not a bonobo. OK, so Susie's going to put food. And that's the potential recipient. This is the empty door, uh, the empty room. And Saki, who's the subject, she's about five years old, and she's going to be let into the room. And she can just eat all the yummy food, or she can let somebody in. Oops. OK, here she comes. It's looking bad, it's looking bad. So the interesting control is, of course, if we let the subject in, there's no recipient. They just immediately quickly eat all the food within 60 seconds. Uh, no, we did not see a difference. Uh, our sample size is um, lacking, but we have adults, and there was no difference. I couldn't do. I can do a qualitative comparison, but not. OK, so now I want to switch gears on you. And since we're, we're uh, slowly recovering, I wanted to talk to you uh, about economic decision making. Because we've also looked at bonobo chimpanzee economic decision making. And uh, as we all worry about how do, what do we do uh, in terms of uh, the future, uh, I just want to share with you um, not only what do um, chimps and bonobos do, but what do Duke undergraduates do. OK. So, Working together with the Center for uh, uh, Neuroeconomic Studies, which is led by Michael Platt, who's the director of the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences, um, and Sarah Habroner, who was his graduate student, and I actually knew her before um, I was at Duke and she was at Duke, um, we did a study to test what kind of preferences bonobos and chimpanzees have for risk and risky decisions. How the heck do you do that? Well, we just came up with a nonverbal test where we can give them a choice between something uh, an, one um, potential outcome that's variable and one potential outcome that's fixed. But the variable outcome can be really, really good or it can be really bad. So it's a slot machine. The other one is fixed, but it's always kind of mm, mediocre. Okay? So think of it this way. The variable option, 50% of the time, you get a lot of food. 50% of the time, eh, it's not very exciting. OK, but the other thing that you can choose is the intermediate outcome, which is that you get sort of an average amount of food. It's always there. It will never vary. And just choose that one. You will get the four. OK? So basically, if you choose this option, sometimes you're going to win big. Sometimes you're going to lose. If you choose the other option, you know what you're going to get. OK? So in Duke terms, think of national championships. What do you prefer? OK? So we give this test to chimpanzees and bonobos. And what we find is that very quickly, in the beginning, they're kind of not that different from one another. But, but the more we give them tests of this kind, chimpanzees become addicted to gambling. So the higher you go up, that's more you like the risky option, the variable option. And the lower you go is the more you like the safe option. And what we find is the more we do this, the more risk-averse bonobos become. And the more we do it, the more risk 
prone chimps become. So much so that the graduate student who did this, Alex, Alexandra Rosati, who's going to graduate next year, um, she basically said, oh my gosh, if I w worked in Las Vegas, I would make a gambling machine for chimpanzees because you would make a killing. They can't stop. They've got a gambling problem. Okay. So basically, we have one close relative that's addicted to gambling, and we have another that is completely risk averse. So um, you know, you've got a, you've basically, uh, I guess in Wall Street terms, you have a bear and a bull. But, and, and just to be clear on how we do this, is those variable and um, uh, fixed options, we just present them to them in bowls, and we show them, hey, this is the one that's always variable, this is the one that's fixed, and so then they learn uh, which contingency is going to be from where, and then they start choosing, um, and then you can see the preference. Okay. So, but then we did another version of this where essentially um, we varied the safe option, and what you see is there's um, the safe option is really, really bad. The non-variable option, you only get one piece of food. And then all the way to the safe option is really, really good. You get six pieces of food, OK? Um, which is almost, it's, it's close to, um, it's actually close to what the risky, um, what, what the payoff of the risky option is, OK? Um, and what you see is the same thing. You have chimpanzees are, this is the, the higher you are, the more risky you are, the lower you are. Uh, the more risk averse you are. And what you see is chimps, really risk prone, bonobos, really risk averse. Um, but we designed this study because we were really curious what do Duke undergraduates do? Because why can't we use the same test with people? And of course, if I had more time, I'd have some of you up here to play this test, or I could have you, like my students, phone in and tell me what you would do. Um, so, what do you guys think? You got it. So Duke undergraduates are chimpanzees. <laughs> Go for it, baby. All right. So, but it's interesting because then, of course, these are humans playing for food. Food is not the normal currency that you would probably think about in terms of making these kinds of decisions as living in an industrialized, na industrialized nation where you think food comes from a grocery store or a refrigerator. So, of course, it'd be interesting to play this cross-culturally with people who are foraging populations, et cetera, and people have played similar games to this. But we also looked at objects and money. And interestingly enough, what you see is that it doesn't matter what you do, um, you know, Duke undergraduates are incredibly risk prone, except when you start playing with money. <laughs> um, and then they get a little bit more careful. Um, so basically, I think what this highlights is that they're, just because animals don't have an economy like you and I would think of an economy, they actually do make economic decisions, and they have economic preferences, and our economic preferences may be shared with our close relatives, and part of the reason why we do what we do is because we share almost 99% of our DNA with these guys. And so when you're trying to think about why is it that the economy is doing what it's doing, why is it that people keep making the same mistakes historically, well, it's not that culture can't have a huge influence. Absolutely, absolutely. But to ignore the biological basis of the decisions that people are making, I think, is just to be destined to make the same mistakes over and over again. OK, so to sum up, I would actually argue, if somebody pushes me on this, what is the most intelligent ape in our family? Well, OK, yeah, we went to the moon, and I have an iPad, and you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, I love the internet. I couldn't make it probably a day uh, without the internet. I'm totally email obsessed like everybody. Um, you know, I love television, I drive my car, et cetera, et cetera. These are all amazing innovations. I, I love medicine that saves my life, et cetera. All of that stuff is wonderful. All right. But if you take the darker side of human nature and you ask the question, it gets a little more difficult to answer who's the most intelligent. Because if you start thinking about stranger phobia and gang murder, sexual coercion like rape, sexual taboos, infanticide, and the proclivity to gamble, well, we got problems. And the only species up here who doesn't have serious problems with any of those things is the bonobo. So I don't know who's more intelligent, but it makes me stop and think, would I give my iPad up to be a bonobo? Are they doing something that you know, is actually kind of better, in a way, than all the wonderful I mean, uh, technology that we have? At the very least, it makes me desperately curious to understand the biological basis of how they do this um, so that we can understand more about ourselves. Okay.
the sad story, of course, and um, this is where I want to talk to you about our service to society um, and why we do what we do the way we do it. We don't work with laboratory animals, which is the normal way that people study animals. We, um, uh, to put it negatively, we are the worst mooches in the world. Um, but to put it positively, we do it on purpose because we like to use animals that other people care for. So for instance, welfare organizations or conservation organizations because our research money, our research efforts actually go to benefit these organizations trying to save these animals. Okay. So um, of course, we have major problems with habitat loss in many of the places where these animals live. Um, but actually, the number one threat to bonobos and chimpanzees is the illegal bushmeat trade and the pet trade. And of course, I could tell you the long story of why the United States and why in, in, in many ways we're complicit in this. Um, but I'll skip it and you can ask me the details. Or alternatively, you can read my wife's book, um, uh, which is called Bonobo Handshake. It came out um, a year and a half ago and it really explains why we work in Africa with the animals we work with and it tells the story of why we are so motivated um, to try to help bonobos in particular. Um, but one of the things that I was asked to do because I work in these sanctuaries with the orphans is I was approached by Claudine Andre who founded the orphanage and she asked me, she's, she's this beautiful francophone woman and she says to me, she says, you know, I want to release the bonobos back into the wild. Um, some of the bonobos in my sanctuary are back in the wild but I need your, I need your help. And I'm thinking, Oh goodness, <laughs> um, I don't know anything about this. But this is one of the ways that we got involved to try to help give back um, to one of these organizations. So that's exactly what I did. I try, uh, and actually some Duke students were involved in this as well. Um, we, uh, we helped them organize and um, uh, carry out the release of 15 bonobos that live at this beautiful sanctuary in Kinshasa and fly them to uh, deep into the Congo Basin to uh, near a city called Basankusu. It's a city of 100,000 people, no doctor, one nurse. Um, and so, uh, so we flew up there, released the bonobos, and they are now doing fantastic um, back in the wild, and we've been involved in trying to monitor them and help make sure that they stay protected. Um, okay. uh, and part of what we have to do to make sure that they stay protected is we have to help the local populations. So we've been working with all sorts of folks across Duke, um, uh, whether it is, uh, that's me uh, desperately trying to communicate with some young, uh, excited kids, uh, delivering educational, um, any educational material we can scrounge together. Uh, but of course, the most popular thing we did is we got some used athletic equipment from the athletic department, and we managed to get it uh, to Boston Kusu. And the exciting thing is that the first thing that happened was they renamed the local soccer team, the Boston Kusu Bonobos, because they were so excited to have footballs from America and soccer cleats. So, uh, and they actually went to the semifinals that year. So uh, Bonobos became very popular in the city very quickly. Um, and we've also worked with the Duke Global Health Institute to get, um, uh, and actually Karina Duffy was an absolute angel. She's just over here, my lab coordinator, worked her head off to get the medical supplies uh, organized so we could ship them we had a donation from DHL to help us get them to Congo. Uh, and then locally, we've tried to uh, have impact. Um, first of all, we invented uh, Primate Palooza, and these are actually undergraduates at Duke. Um, uh, this guy, uh, his name is Joel Braid. He was actually photographed at uh, Cameron uh, with Dickie V about, uh, well, I guess, last month uh, during March Madness. He actually got into the Duke, uh, Carol I wonder, it wouldn't have been March Madness, sorry, it was the Duke Carolina game. Um, and, and he's with Dickie V in the, in the Duke student section, and you got this guy in the lemur costume, so it's pretty funny. But, um, so these guys run around campus trying to get people excited about Primate Palooza, which is basically um, a series of events for the public over a week to get young children excited about science and engage with the local community here. And then we've been going to um, science festivals to play the games that you guys played to start off with, and of course we have developed curriculum that we've got into the local classrooms as well. Um, trying to teach people about just behavior and conservation um, uh, in general. And the reason that I think that's really exciting, I should stop and just say, is that the normal way that science curriculum and the way that it, I was introduced to me is that, you know, if you're interested in animals, then you're going to be a veterinarian or a biologist or something like that. No conversation about psychology, cognition, animal psychology, et cetera, which is so accessible and so exciting to little kids. And, you know, it just immediately gets them 
pumped up that actually science can be fun, it doesn't always have to be hard, and we can really quickly do an experiment and answer a real question. Um, so it's really fun to be involved with. Okay, so um, uh, my hope is that by doing these comparisons of chimps and bonobos, that we're gonna have a better understanding of uh, when our inner chimpanzee or bonobo might be released, but my hope is that um, we can figure out how to always release our inner bonobo. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, for us to be successful uh, in saving the, our close relatives in Congo in particular, um, this is Claudine Andre, who we work with, and of course the Jane Goodall Institute now has their um, long-term database here. Ann Pusey is the chair of our department. We're very lucky at Duke to have a completely unique data set um, and the collaboration we have with the Jane Goodall Institute, but the point is, for us to be successful, we're gonna have to have happy and healthy humans uh, in Congo, so that's what we're working towards. Okay, so with what energy you guys have left, I wanna turn now to my second question, how did we get that way? And the reason that we're studying lemurs is because we're trying to figure out, the wonderful thing about the lemur center is they have so many different lemur species. And they're all from Madagascar, and they're incredibly closely related, yet they live in lots of different environments. Some eat fruit, some eat leaves, some live in big groups, some live in small groups. And this, over evolutionary time, may have shaped how they solve problems. So what my undergraduates have done is come up with very simple tests um, that you present to young children as well, uh, and present them to the lemurs. But the exciting thing is, just like we've done with the bonobos and chimps, just two species, or we compare bonobo, chimp, human, they've done this with 10 species. Um, and people have gotten so excited about their accomplishments of being able to compare these 10 different species that people have joined us, and now we've got, a, we, one of our projects, we have people, we have people from, uh, let's see, seven, sorry, 14 different laboratories across, uh, from seven different nations are contributing data um, for a project that started at the Lemur Center. Um, so, this is just an example of a very simple test that we can uh, do with lemurs. And what happens is, whoops, Sorry about that. I just wanted to stop it so I could tell you. Okay, so what happens is we're just gonna put food in this little opaque barrier, uh, and all the lemur has to do is get it out. But then what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch the opaque barrier to a transparent barrier, okay? So they know that it's very easy to get um, food out of the opaque cylinder, but when we switch it to transparent, now they have two pieces of competing information. They have their previous success of going around the cylinder to get the food, and then I can see it, so I can just reach for it, except for the barrier is transparent. So what we found is that some species, like this rough lemur here, which you guys hopefully can go see at the lemur center, um, and these are the undergraduates that have been involved in this. This is very easy for the rough lemur. This is. All right, so it's very easy for one of these beautiful lemurs to solve that problem. And it's actually very easy for the rough lemur to solve the other problem. So we put the food in there. There you go, there's your little grape. No problem, okay. Is this even a test, are you joking? Could an animal really fail at this? Who's ever heard of Zavumufu? Anybody? Okay, well, this is really Zavumufu. What does Zavumufu do? Here's the test, very sad. This is actually about the fifth or sixth time that Zubufu had this test. <laughs> very difficult. Okay. So, the goal here is not to find out what animal is smart or dumb, though. Of course, the, the goal is to understand why is it that certain animals that eat certain things or have certain types of social systems can solve some problems while other species can solve other problems efficiently and effectively. 
And just to tell you, this is Roshan Reddy, this is Joel Bray, Aaron Sandell. Aaron actually was an undergraduate at Duke, and now he's at Michigan, and he's studying the Ngogo chimpanzees that I told you about that actually invaded and killed all their neighboring, um, uh, all their neighbors. So he's now at Michigan, and he started but with, with his work here at Duke at the Lemerstein. Uh, and so we've just found all sorts of amazing differences. This is just an example of some of the data from that task. You can see the poor little Shafaks down here. The, the higher you get, the better you did. They're really struggling relative to the other species. So what we can do through some fancy analysis, not represented here, of course, is we can try to figure out sort of why is it that some species are really good at this and some species are not so good. Poor Shafox. Okay. But to finish up, what I want to now uh, come down the final stretch here and tell you about why do we have the Duke Canine Cognition Center. Um, and there's so many reasons. Um, and of course, we're very, very excited to be able to study dogs. And, and it's also very unique that we have a Duke Canine Cognition Center, and, I'm, and it's actually located in the Evolutionary Anthropology Program. You can imagine how many times I've had to answer the question, wait, you study human evolution, but you have a dog center. Um, I, don't, I don't get the connection here. So hopefully I can help you. All right. So first of all, we have over 900 owners um, uh, who have signed up to, uh, or I should say parents, who have signed up to volunteer time to bring their dogs in and play fun games with us. And we're going to get Stella, who's actually from the uh, eyes, ears, nose, and paws in a few minutes here, uh, to come demonstrate a couple of the tests that we play. Uh, and so you can root for her. Um, but uh, basically, Instead of me having uh, five or six monkeys in cages that I study for a 30-year period or whatever, I am really excited because I can have dogs, I can have thousands of them, I can have a big sample of animals. They don't live at Duke, they live in people's homes, they're very happy, they can come in, I can play fun games with them, and they can go home. Um, and so, uh, and not only that, but because dogs are very busy people, I don't know if you know this, um, during, during the recession, there actually was a major hiring splurge on dogs. Um, uh, one of the fastest growing parts of the economy was one, the pet industry, and two, the, while you know, we were having trouble uh, keeping jobs, dogs were actually in greater demand than ever. Um, so what we're trying to do is help dogs do their job better by learning how their psychology works. Um, and the, our system is essentially like what happens with developmental psychologists who bring their you know, children, sorry, parents bring their children in to be tested, and it's the exact same thing. So the reason I got started in this is because I was 19 years old. I went to my advisor at Emory University, Mike Tomasello, who was actually a Duke alum. Uh, and I said to him, uh, look, we've been playing this game right here, uh, where th imagine this is me, not the cute little anime girl. Um, and I'm pointing uh, to this cup instead of this cup. And I'm trying to tell a chimpanzee or a bonobo where something is. Now, I promised you in the beginning that really what I'm interested in is in what is it that makes us human. But then I went off to tell you about this um, comparison of bonobos and chimps and lethal aggression and risk taking, et cetera, and how they're similar to us. But we've also discovered ways in which we're really different. And this is one of those ways. Because it ends up that using gestural communication is one of the very first things that emerges incredibly early in our species. And I've just, uh, I've just uh, observed this in my own daughter. Between 9 and 12 months old, social cognitive abilities come online that don't start developing in other great apes, chimps and bonobos in particular, till they're five or six years old. So we have this an amazing early emergence of social skills. And put on top of that, that when we're born, our brain is only 25% developed. Yet theirs is somewhere between 50 and 60% developed. So something crazy is going on with human brain development. And this is one of the first phenomenon that was observed to, un to reveal what I just described to you, which is that if you point to one of two cups that has food in it. And basically, um, you're just trying to help the chimpanzee or bonobo find the foods. It's over here. They are horrible at this. I've spent weeks of my life trying to helpfully tell chimpanzees and bonobos where food is. Um, you know, it's there, it's there, OK? And you can give them lots and lots of repetitions. They finally can slowly learn it. But then if you just do something slightly different, it completely throws them apart. I mean, they fall apart. Young kids between 9 and 12 months old, and especially by 14 months old, are masters of this game. Mike Thomasall had said to me, the reason that I've spent, sent you out to study chimpanzees and spend weeks and weeks being really frustrated with them completely failing something so elementary is because we think this is really important as sort of the foundation of human social cognition that leads to language, that leads to culture. And we think this has uniquely evolved in our species. And I said, uniquely? And he, and he said, yeah, 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 only humans. I'm like, well, I think my dog does that. Um, 
and so, and so, so, so he said, ah, oh, yeah. and of course he didn't have a dog, and, and he actually had never had a dog. And so he said, ah, oh, you know, everybody's dog does calculus, and da, 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 da. And I said, no, no, seriously, Mike, my dog does that, I'm sure, okay? So I'm 19, arguing with like this permanent scholar or whatever, and he was fantastic, but he said, okay, let's do an experiment. You know, if you're so sure, let's do an experiment. So we did, and um, you know, the punchline is, we went and did the same game with dogs, and they are masterful. Um, they spontaneously solve these problems. Um, even the youngest puppy, regardless of whether they've been raised by humans or not, spontaneously are able to use human gestures. Wolves are not very good at this. Um, and it seems to be something that is a product of um, domestication, because I went to Siberia and studied some experimentally domesticated foxes, and they actually show the same skill after 50 years of artificial selection, simply based on whether they were aggressive or not towards humans. So basically, really nice foxes get smarter. Um, and so we were able to show that this is a result of domestication. Uh, and remember, I want to understand how is it that you have cognitive changes that might be important for humans. Okay, now you can see why we have dogs in the Department of Evolutionary Anthropology. Okay, so what we find when we test dogs is this is really easy. I can just look to where the food is. That's easy for dogs relative to other animals. And then here's a funny one where we do something they've never ever seen before because presumably, you know, anybody who has had a dog and you're a human so you can't help but communicate this way or look to where you're trying to communicate with somebody. But we do something like this where we put a block on where the food is. No problem, this is really easy for them. And of course we do olfactory controls where we give them no information at all and what we found is they guess randomly. And the only thing we're interested in is their first choice. So we only give them one choice. They don't get to go back and forth searching. They have to go directly to where they think it is. Because they could use their nose if we, if, if we let them sniff it out, of course eventually they could find it. But what we're interested in is where do they go first? All right. So I think what I want to do now is, um, I guess I'll just show you, um, let's, let's work with Stella now, why not? All right, let's bring Stella up here. And let me introduce uh, ears, nose, and, or sorry, eyes, ears, nose, and paws. And um, I'm gonna let Deb here introduce herself and just tell you a little bit about Stella and what she's been trained to do. Because I have to say that, first of all, one of the most fun things I did is I did their graduation uh, uh, commencement, or I guess speech or whatever, uh, for their first graduating class. And you, usually I think if you give a graduation lecture, you're really, really worried about are the kids gonna go out and be you know, the best and are they gonna really do the right thing and blah, blah, and I was like, this is easy, they're dogs, of course they're gonna do the right thing. So that was easy. Um, and then, of course, I also, having not been involved in the service dog um, uh, um, uh, you know, business, uh, I had never seen the effect that these dogs could have on people's lives and I was just shocked when I saw the, um, uh, you know, the, the future owners of the dogs that had just graduated come and tell the story of how these dogs absolutely changed their lives. So let me just introduce Deb, and Deb actually works locally here in Carborough, and the big problem we have, and the reason we're trying to study dog cognition is to help her and other organizations like hers get better at producing dogs faster because we have a huge supply problem. And I can't wait until he uh, finishes that study and gives me all the answers I need. Um, my name is Deb Cunningham, and I'm with Eyes, Ears, Nose, and Paws. I'm the program director, and uh, with me is Stella. Uh, Stella is one of our uh, dogs that's getting ready to graduate, um, and we hope to graduate her in June, on June 23rd. Um, we have, as Brian mentioned, we have a graduation ceremony to uh, welcome uh, the new teams out into the community. Um, it's open to the public, and if you guys live here locally or happen to be in town, we'd love to have you. Um, we did have Brian speak at our first, uh, our, uh, he was our keynote speaker for our first graduation. Um, and it so happens that we have another Duke professor who's going to be the uh, keynote speaker at uh, uh, this next graduation. Her name is Kathy Rudy, and she just recently published a book called Loving uh, Animals. Cool. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to put Stella on the spot. We did give her four warm-up trials before you guys got here. So what we did is we just told her that we're going to put food in one of these two buckets. That's all she's ever done. Um, and we're just going to test her, all right? So you guys cross your fingers for her that she represents her species well. And by the way, her parents are just there very nervous. All 
All right, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to hide food in one of the two places. She won't know where, but she knows it's hidden. I'm just going to try to tell her where it is. That's all. All right, you guys know where I put it? OK, good. Oh, the poor chimpanzees and bonobos. <laughs> okay, you want to do one more? <laughs> that is where it was. I should tell you. Yay. All right, one more. Ready? Oh, whoops. I need my sign. <laughs> Yeah, you guys know where it is? Yay, Stella. OK, now, <laughs> just to be sure, just to be sure. All right, do you guys want to do something? Do you guys want to give her a novel cue? I don't know what she'll do. But we can give her a strange cue. Do you want me to? I can point with my foot. You want me to do that? OK, let's see if she can do it. Now that, I'm sure, is not something she typically sees. I have no idea what she'll do. Let's find out. about to fall over. <laughs> go, Stella. Go. You can go. It's OK. There. OK. <laughs> you can go there. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. So that's interesting. So somebody said Clever Hans, which is right. Um, there's a horse that um, basically people thought could do calculus. Um, and then they did a controlled experiment. And they found out that the horse was using subtle cues that, the, that its trainer was giving off. And of course, it didn't know calculus at all. But Clever Hans gets a really bad rap. Because everybody's so disappointed that it didn't do calculus, the horse that didn't do calculus, that everybody forgets the horse had figured out how to trick everybody that it knew calculus. <laughs> I wish I could done that in school. Uh, and of course, how was Clever doing that? He, he was using subtle social cues given off by the human to figure out when to stop. And that's exactly what young humans are doing when they're trying to first figure out how to interact with adults and learn culturally. So what seems really stupid and unimpressive is actually what I would argue one of the crucial first steps to becoming human. Um, and so you don't see that in chimpanzees and bonobos, our closest relatives, but you do see it in dogs who are incredibly distant related to, distantly related to us, but you don't see it in wolves. So I think actually domestication is an incredibly powerful uh, force that shapes animal psychology in interesting ways that we can make conclusions about how psychology has changed in some animals. OK, and then just to tell you uh, really seriously, I'm not joking when I say that chimpanzees are not very good at this. Um, this is my uh, good friend Fifi, and I'm going to hide a grape. And this is the test where there's a novel cue. OK, where is it, guys? All right, so you can do this over and over. She scratches her head. You can do this over and over, and Fifi really is a chance, doesn't know where it is. All right, and then. For all the dog lovers, but sad for anybody who loves great apes, this goofy looking mutt who's never seen this problem before does the same thing. Ta -da. OK, and then we can look at the data just really quickly. Dogs actually do better than the chimpanzees, and I can tell you details of. Uh, it's, it's even worse than it looks. Okay. 
So I wrote a paper together with my undergraduate um, advisor in 2005, basically human-like social skills in dogs, and we make the argument that dogs have actually converged on to have some of the psychological abilities we see in young children, um, and we've been pursuing that ever since, and I've told you as well that our, what we're hoping is the more we study these things that we're going to understand more how dogs, not only how they're similar to us, but also the cognitive limitations that they experience when they're trying to help us work uh, and solve problems together. Because we're not just trying to make dogs little people, we also want to know what the limits of their cognitive abilities are as well, because that'll help trainers know you may not be able to train a dog um, to not make that mistake over and over, and so then you can navigate around it instead of trying to go through it. Um, and so these are all the types of crazy questions people are now asking about dogs, and dogs have become sort of the hot, exciting animal to study. Before 1998, before we got started studying dogs, actually nobody in the US studied dogs and studied dog psychology. And now Duke is the first to have the Duke Canine Cognition Center, and now uh, in Europe there are several centers, and slowly in the United States um, there are a number of groups. There's one at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and there are a couple of other places in the US that are considering uh, to study dogs. Um, and these are the types of questions, things like, are dogs capable of intentional deception? Some of you are absolutely nodding yes. Um, do dogs know uh, what you can see and what you can't see? Do they know what you know? Uh, do they understand symbols like children? Do they take shortcuts? How do they navigate? Uh, do different dog breeds differ, et cetera, et cetera? So the book I wrote, The Genius of Dogs, which is coming out next year, uh, tries to answer these questions based on the last 15 years of research on dog psychology. So uh, I'm going to stop there and say thank you. But before we, before we end, I just want to make one appeal to you. And I want to propose one idea. Um, and it was actually proposed to me by another alum, um, which is that I was just thinking about how do you promote undergraduate research uh, together with this person. And they said, it would it be a great idea if for science there was something like the startup challenge here at Duke. It's been so successful in the business school. What if, for undergraduates, you did something similar? And it made me think of this website that I saw called Petri Dish. And actually, uh, one of my colleagues pointed it out to me because of this particular project. Um, uh, one of my colleagues is actually trying to understand the ancient DNA in dogs in Africa. But because this is sort of an untraditional project, and it's going to have lots of undergraduate involvement, he's having difficulty attracting funds. So they made a YouTube video, they went to Petri Dish, and they proposed their idea. And they've raised $3,000. Uh, they need five more. Um, but the point is that this website is giving people the, the possibility to propose research and get non-traditional funding. And it just made me think, together um, with this person who actually suggested this, that um, what if Duke just did this on its own? What if we uh, had a way for undergraduates to propose research projects that alums or Duke, people in the Duke commu community could fund? Uh, and people could choose what to fund and what not to fund. Uh, and it could give us another way to have uh, exciting competition and ways to get non-traditional studies started and really inspire people to get involved early in their careers in science. So with that, now I really end and say thank you. Uh, and if anybody has any more questions, Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.